Did you guys see the Amazon Echo? Yes, I, I did. I, I was going to mention that in Tech Talk Echo. today. Yes. Yeah. And you guys are talking about Google so, Voice and that not. The Amazon Echo is really something, and there's been some really, really great parodies, and uh, I want to play one of my favorite Amazon Echo parodies for you. It's pretty what fantastic. You, what are you doing, Dave? What is it? Is it for me? It's for everyone. Is it on? It's always on. Can it hear me right now? I can hear you from anywhere in the room. I've put wrapping paper on your shopping list. But what day is it? Today is Thursday, November 13th. Eight minutes starting now. I can play music, answer questions, get the news and weather, create to-do lists. Alexa! And much more. <laughs> wow. Introducing Amazon Echo. She's listening. I wonder why they didn't just call it Echo. Creepy. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. It's like everyone know it. Everyone's being harsh on it, but it's like it's kind of interesting. You know, yeah, I, I thought it, I, I actually uh, was kind of impressed. Like it doesn't look like it has like a <laughs> over ambitious feature set. No, it, well, it's pretty. Uh, Pretty, uh, I mean, it, so who doesn't want Jarvis, right? Everybody wants everybody wants to be Tony Stark with Jarvis. Everybody wants the Enterprise computer in their house, obviously. I want to be in my studio, and I want to say, you know, computer. Alexia or computer or Jarvis yeah. or whatever. Well, you can do that now. Whatever it computer. is, you know, set the temperature in the other room to 75 degrees, turn the TV to this channel, and, uh, you know, whatever. And by the time I walk out there, the TVs are ready to go and stuff like that. Obviously, that would be amazing. But this thing... What does this do that Google now can't do? And it's always with you in every single room. Great point. That's the thing, though. It's, 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 it's not about that. It's about the, being a device that does that. And I don't know of any, because I went around and I looked. Yeah, as soon exactly. as I saw it, I thought, exactly. I don't really want Amazon's hmm. thing. I'd rather have the Google one. But I looked around, it's like, wait a minute, there is none. Yeah, it's not, really not about the device. It's about yeah, the software. Yeah, there is. Yeah. It's called your phone. Well, no. 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 I understand where you're coming from, but like, there's no sit in house device that right. I can just set down. Yeah, that's and true. Anyone can yeah, use. Absolutely. Or a and tablet. That's what I kind of well, at it, like. a tablet. I've, yeah, I've, but you know, yeah. something you can plug in and use, and kind of just have stand there as a little piece. And apply it. <laughs> I follow yeah. you. I've got. Yeah. I've got a couple of couple of questions. The first is: Is this available in the U.S. now? And has anyone got one? Uh, it is available, I believe. I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not uh, no, I, I it's only. Oh, okay. Yeah, like a, so, yeah, the sign up list. I don't right feel now. like buying one, so I didn't even bother. Yeah, right, you have okay. to go and sign up on the list, and then they'll let. I think it was a hundred people of like a uh, hundred or so. I I, I can't remember. That's if it was. so funny. Has, Art um, has anyone has anyone in here got an Amazon Fire TV? Uh, now that I will probably be getting for the studio in a little while, I, I've, I have a few uh, friends who have told me they are pretty good, but I don't have one. That, no. they are, they're not just they're not just pretty good; they're damn storming amazing. Yeah. But I was going to say one of the features on the Amazon TV is voice recognition, yeah. and it makes it makes the Google voice recognition look like amateur hour. It is absolutely well, now, amazing. How can that be? And because this is what's how can oh, that be? I don't be? know, but it's so good. It's not that difficult, dude. Well, no. I mean, think about what Google does to get their voice recognition no, as good as Google, it is, right? Google, <laughs> well, yeah, no, yeah, and that's, uh, that's, that's a hilarious it, catastrophe. Th yeah, it. that is a shame. If 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 Amazon... When, where, where would Amazon... Amazon doesn't have millions of voice samples a day. Where is Amazon getting this from? Well, right? that, that, that's what that's what allowed them to focus on actually uh, Are, a better... Well, I wonder and if that part alone is creepy because that means it's got to be the Fire tablets. Or no, maybe they're just licensing new ones. Maybe it's because oh. so many people have the Fire phone. Maybe. But we've, we've handed <laughs> the remote around in the house between different well, people who've got different voice cadence or different sexes, and this thing just works every single time. Daredevil and never misses a beat. It's absolutely brilliant. Daredevil and Susie seems to know it, though. What is it, Daredevil? So they have two things. First is they have uh, actually very good machine learning algorithms, which they already use to know what it. you want to buy. And uh, they've been investing and in actually hiring on that department oh, okay. so uh, they, for a while. It's in-house. And the, uh, there's, I'm not sure if it's totally in house, but they hired people at least. Um, in during this last year, they've been hiring all like a lot of people in in this area, machine learning algorithms, and natural language processing. Okay. And they also have another service they do, which something like um, actually persons go and surveying something, 
I'm not sure on the specifics, but it's some sort of service that it's to get people to audit sites and things like that. So I'm figuring that the process of getting some data from them shouldn't be too hard. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Especially to, with this. The problem with the actual natural language processing now isn't really getting samples anymore. It's actually, you know, being able to have an algorithm that can understand them. Yeah. Wimpy. Well, the, oh, go ahead. Well, go on. Sorry, Chris. No, go ahead. Well, no, I, I was I was just going to say that the Amazon voice recognition is is excellent. And whilst Amazon might might understand my buying habits and preferences because it's basically a narrow field of science fiction titles, when I hand the remote to my wife who's oh, into romantic sure. comedies, it yeah. picks up and understands everything she's that's, asking for just fine. Right. And you know, I suppose in that sense, if they know maybe the context is movie titles. Right, that really narrows the scope of what it is. Yeah, well, it's not, you see, because because it's it's movies, television, sure. music, yeah. apps, and right. and a whole load of other stuff. Yeah, okay. I'll tell you the, the the only the only trick that Amazon have missed, and this is the one thing about the Amazon Fire TV that I really irritates, is that they've they they've walled off this brilliant feature of voice search from all of the other providers, oh, so you so can it, install it go Plex. across the app. Exactly. So you can install uh, Plex and you can install Netflix, but when you go and ask it to go and search for The Walking Dead, yeah, it will only search Amazon. It won't yeah. go to any of those other places, oh, wow. and that's that. And that is just such a fail because you can see why Amazon are doing it, but they're doing it for all the wrong reasons. Oh, of course they are, but they're going to be very successful at it. Yeah, but uh, uh, oh, everything else media. about it is 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 just brilliant. It's it's um. Replaced our Roku in the front room. Uh, yeah, I think that's what I was thinking too. Is it might be our Roku, and and it's actually a half decent gaming machine as well. As you know, I'm not much of a gamer, so I'm probably not a good um, re reference candidate here. But uh, I play games on my Amazon Fire TV now, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the best thing I've ever had. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Wimpy, uh, once we get into the show a little bit, we got a little uh, something we're going to uh, tell people about. I don't don't say anything, but a little something something. Yeah. yeah. All right, we'll do that a little bit in the show. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that's loaded with protein and wishes a very grateful, happy Veterans Day to all the vets in the audience. My name is Chris. And my name is Matt. Hey there, Matt. Happy Veterans Day to all the vets, like we say. And Matt, happy Tuesday to yourself. And happy Tuesday to you as <laughs> Thanks. well. I know, I feel like such a slacker <laughs> on this. This is like the day of the year that I feel like the biggest slacker ever. Doesn't matter how hard I work or how many hours I feel like today. I've been a slacker. <laughs> so I went out and to celebrate, I got I got one of those monster breakfasts where it's so much breakfast that you don't eat for pretty much until dinner and I'm still good. I got steak and eggs, Matt. And oh, it was, nice. Oh, Matt. Oh, it was a really, there's just, there's Tuesdays have been good eat days, I guess. So I'm ready to go. You know, hopefully, hopefully we will avoid the flames in today's episode. We're going to follow up on the Firefox challenge, run through some of the experiences and challenges that I had. We've got something really fun coming up towards the end of the show. And we're also going to discuss this whole GNOME versus Groupon over the trademark, where that's at right now, what Groupon's been saying, and how much damn money the GNOME Foundation has raised. A lot of stuff. Plus, we've got a ton of great feedback going on in today's episode. So I think probably the best thing to do is arm ourselves with knowledge. That knowledge supplied directly thanks to cranial implants that are connected to Mumble. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Oh, greeting. <laughs> All right, Did you eat at that amazing place nearby the studio? Yeah, yeah. Ellie's. Yeah. yeah. Oh gosh, I love that place. It's it's so good. It's so good. And like all the people there, I'm like I'm I'm the only guy where I don't know everybody's name. It's like cheers up in that joint, and yeah. only it's breakfast food. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. It's really weird. Yeah. All right. So let's start with uh, let's we'll start with some follow up emails. Just a quick one. I'll leave the details uh, in the show notes. But Ben wrote in with sort of one of the best write ups on how to fix the Nvidia. VSync issue that we were seeing, or that we had an email about last week. We had a few solutions. Uh, ben had one where you just toss an export uh, line into your uh, dot profile file, and uh, then that will take care of it. And he says, I love the show. I just wanted to chime in on the game VSync issues that David from Alabama was experiencing in Linux Unplugged 65. Basically, he fixed his VSync issues by forcing the Unity compositor to VSync for him. 
and he's looking for a way to do the same in GNOME. This is not the way to go. Every time someone suggests using Compton or turning off Unidirect's full screen or using another way to force the compositor during games, I scream in frustration. You're losing out on a ton of performance and you're increasing input latency in games, which makes playing Twitch games like Counter-Strike Global Offensive darn near impossible. So he's got a command in there you can put in there that should take care of it. If you're out there having some tearing issues on nice. your uh, NVIDIA games, yeah. So thank you, Ben. For We had a bunch of good responses, too. Now, uh, Noah, you're in here on your uh, quote-unquote cheap uh, podcasting Linux rig right now, right? I am. <clears throat> okay, well, I think we'll start this. I'll toss this question to you, and uh, then we'll get everybody's input. But here's the uh, here's our first sort of like uh, we're putting it actually in the show coverage of USB headphones on Linux. We get this question all the time. We talk about it on the pre-show live stream all the time in the mumble room. But now we're going to get it right here. Wiggle Waffles writes in. He says, hi, all. I'm absolutely horrible. <laughs> I have a, I've had a horrible time troubleshooting tech issues with my mom's C720 running Ubuntu GNOME 1404. She's now doing it over the phone, and she needs a USB headset to make Skype calls while traveling. Searching the web for Linux-compatible headphones has proved totally useless. And, of course, manufacturers don't include any such info in their product descriptions. Matt mentioned some arcane sound controller name on last regarding this issue, but I have no idea what <laughs> headphones they were or what type of controller headphones even have in them. So any help would be appreciated. I'm looking for something low-cost and basic for Skype calling. So no high-end suggestions. Frankly, I've decided I'm never installing Linux on a family member's computer again because once you install Linux, you're, only, you're the only tech support they have. Oh, I see his point. Uh, he says he goes on to say that uh, there's also always that one hardware feature that doesn't seem to work, which is frustrating for him, and that they need that has no Linux equivalent. The only success in this area, though, is he moved his dad to a Linux machine with email, web, and nothing else, and it works for him. So I suppose it depends on the use. So now he's in a spot where he hasn't been able to success. I think he needs to work on his Google Foo. Uh, because uh, there is a, there are some threads out there for good headsets. Matt, what are you wearing right now? Do you know? Uh, it's a Pelot. Uh, a Panas- see, uh, I, no, a re- pan- Yeah, I, I never pronounce this right, but pl- a Platronics, I think is what it is. Um, yeah. I have you know other mics set up to the other computer, but on this yeah. one specifically. Now, I have a headset that I got at Goodwill for $3 that'll work. I'll send him. I mean, hell, it's, it's not hard to find. If it's USB and it goes on your ears... It works. Yeah, that's why that's, he's having a hard time. That's the big secret. Is it pretty Seriously. much works. All right, now, uh, Colonel <laughs> Linux, you've got your cheap rig there. Can you tell us a little bit about your setup and uh, what yeah. kind of Linux, any if any, you compatibility issues you ran into? Right. So uh, my experience is the same. Essentially, almost every USB audio interface I've used recently works. There was one exception. Uh, that was quite a while ago. Um, I uh, Plantronics works really, really well. In fact, that's what's used in the spaceship, so obviously they know something or two about making headsets. Mm-hmm. But I've also found that Logitech, like uh, the H390, yeah. for example, they're like 20 bucks. Best Buy, Office Max, carries them. Amazon, of course, has them. Amazon Prime. And then my latest thing, because this question keeps coming up, is I want decent audio quality. Um, what was the cheapest I could put together a a system that is totally Linux compatible. So you take it out of the box, you plug it in, no configuration, no no compiling drivers, no downloading anything. I just it wanted to work out of the box. How cheap could I do that? And uh, th- now, mind you, this is not meant for putting in your bag and traveling, right? This would be if you want to get a little bit better audio quality than you get from USB headset. But I was able to whittle it down to uh, just under 200 bucks. And uh, I have another microphone on order that's going to come in, and I'm going to see if I can get it down to about 150. Um, but I think for for two hundred dollars, and I'm talking on it right now, I think uh, I think this sounds really good. And yeah. That gets you a USB interface, it gets you a mixer, it gets you a microphones, a headphones, and a so microphone stand. That's a full Linux audio podcasting rig, which I think we should do a full segment on. To be honest, I think yeah. we should. We should. But uh, Wimpy, you sound pretty good today, and you're on a new headset, right? What did you get? I am. Well, I asked the question last week because I had a That's massive right. audio fail last week. <laughs> so right. everyone gave me some advice and I went away and, 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 and did a bit of research. So uh, this week I've bought myself Logitech H800 headset mm. and it's not the cheapest. And I'll explain why I used it. First of all, in terms of Linux support, it's a wireless headset and mic all built in with some buttons on the side for volume control and muting and track skipping and stuff like that. Ooh, wireless and all those, nice. all those media keys work. Um, so it's wireless. It has a USB port uh, plug that you put in your USB. That shows up on your machine and you just go. And, so you're using blue- is it Bluetooth? Uh, it's both. So it has two buttons on the headset. One to use the USB dongle, okay. which is how I'm using it now, plugged into my Linux workstation to do mumble. 
and then you just go into your mixer and just say what your mic is and what your headsets are and all that works but it also has bluetooth so you switch the headset to bluetooth mode and then you compare it with your tablet and your phone so this device now does all of my audio needs. So you can so, use it for your computer or to listen to a podcast from a phone or music or something. Exactly. Like that. Oh, yeah. That so is, if I'm if I'm sitting sweet. downstairs and I want to watch a bit of uh, BSG on my tablet, I just put the headset on, pair it with the tablet, and off I go. So what do you do for the mic? What's the mic using? Is it uh, the mic's built in? It's built into the headset. It's a pull pull down okay, integrated pull down. mic. Okay. Wow. That is a really yeah. cool. So it's Logitech H. 800. H800. H okay. 800. Yeah, and there's a there's um slightly cheaper models as well, but I quite like this one because of the versatility What's we've been able the, to uh, use it with multiple devices. How do you charge it? Uh it's a micro USB charger. Okay. And uh and so when you plug the receiver in, it just shows up to Linux as a USB sound card? It does. Ah, sweet. Nice recommendation. Good find, Wimpy. Uh okay. This is something I think about a lot, and uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna get into this discussion around Firefox and Chrome, and uh, you know one of the things I've noticed a lot in my switch for the week is when something doesn't work right. You know, there's a lot of different suggestions that come at come at a person, um, and I I I, fe- I feel like there's a lot of parallels between when we have people switch to Linux and things don't go right for them, and how we respond to that. And how when I switched to Firefox and things didn't go right and how people have responded to that. I see a lot of parallels there. So I've been thinking a lot about how what I've just gone through reflects how we handle newcomers to Linux. And uh, this first email or this next email that we're going to get to sort of follows that that, that theme that we're going to be talking about later today. Uh, so uh, Mount Agent, I think is how you say it, Rodin or Mount Tangent, I'm not sure. It says, on Sunday's show, Chris and Matt were reminiscing about the good old days of Compiz and how the desktop cube and rad flame effects were pretty good at starting conversations and getting people to try out Linux. I'm they wondering were. what features our beloved OSs you found to be the most pervasive, or I'm sorry, persuasive, to new Linux users. Uh, to be clear, these would be outside the good, well-reasoned arguments for switching. He says, you can believe in the open source philosophy all day long, but willing to make the leap? Well, sometimes a little shiny helps with that. That's what I'm asking about. Mine would largely be about Mac users looking at Linux, since I work primarily with that user base. I'll second the desktop effects thing. As an ongoing, on and off again KDE user, I also find that KDE's incredible level of customization cuts both ways with this. For some, it's a major draw. For others, it's intimidating. Mac users seem to have really enjoyed Cairo Doc, again with the flame effects. Before iOS 7 and 8, uh, the ability to plug in iOS devices and read external storage was a big hit for them too. Oh, and hilariously for Mac users, snapping the tiles of the windows, you know, when you snap a window to the edges, they love that. I still can't understand why Apple doesn't do that in Mac OS. So he says, what other shiny features of Linux, say, be it a desktop environment or otherwise, do you show folks to start them down the road to switching to Linux? Multiple desktops. Multiple desktops is a great one. Uh, Of course, Windows uh, 10 is getting that finally. And Mac OS has spaces... Yeah, uh, but it's it's a not nowhere near as good as like um, I run Cinnamon. I mean, I have ten desktops. Wow! All hockeyed. Wow! Like, and I, I you know, block. Uh, Zeroak, uh, what do you show them in GNOME that you really seems to grab their attention? If somebody is watching me use my machine and I'm using GNOME three, the first thing they notice is when I mouse over to the top left hot corner and everything kind of backs out and I get a nice everything gets out of my way that kind of thing. The activities they, overview. Right. They get all over that stuff. Yeah, Are you talking about, like, like, showing all of your desktops or, like, what? Yeah, well, no, when you go to Activities Overview, all the windows you have open. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that is actually really cool. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I also, you know what one I find really sweet for Mac users, which is just hilarious that the Mac doesn't have this. I love that we're talking. I know. It's just, like, when you click the the clock in Mac OS, it doesn't drop down a calendar. Like, Uh, this is 2014. How do you not? So, anyways. So on GNOME, you know, when I drop down the calendar on GNOME, like, I always show them, like, yeah, and it syncs with my own cloud server and puts all my appointments in there. So that's something that the GNOME's got going for it that's it's pretty nice. Uh, for the uh, shiny features, too, I, I it depends on who your audience is, right? Because different people find different things to be shiny. Some people find the ability to boot off of a USB Live uh, thumb drive and recover your system a shiny feature. Some people think that's not. So, also the desktop cube. Yeah, you could always turn it back say, on. Yeah, just, just go back to Nopix, baby. Go back to Nopix, show them the cube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so if you have any ideas, leave us some feedback. 
uh, on what the shiny thing is. Go, go put Compass back on your rig. Or if you've got uh, Unity, go turn on the Compass Settings Manager and turn on the fire. Or if you're running Plasma, you can, it's native in Cadewin. Yeah, very yeah, true. True. Uh, all right. RA writes in with our last email today. It says, hey, JB, with Fedora 21, when it does finally come out in December, <laughs> probably, you guys should review it. I know you will, but there's just so much great stuff in there. Gnome 3.14, SystemD, DNF, ButterFR, Better, Butter, Butter FS, geez, for easy for me to say, Wayland, and all of the new core apps. And there's some extra dev tools in there, too. I was, I was able to set up my C and C++ and Java environments with just five clicks, and everything is butter smooth. So this is the first time I've got run in a GNOME running under Wayland, actually, and it's quite good. All the apps I have run nicely, probably, though, with X Wayland. Now that I think of it, I, should lo- I would love to be in the mobile room when you guys review it. Would that be possible? Yes, so stay tuned. We will when Fedora 21 comes out have a review, and we will probably do the whole comprehensive thing where we start the review in Linux Action Show, and we're planning to do some pretty solid follow-up in that following week's Unplugged. The Mumble Room's open, so uh, RA, you would always be welcome to join us. They let me in here. Yeah, from time to time at least. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> Haven't kicked you yet. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so uh, I want to talk about uh, the Firefox switch. I think that's something we should probably get to. Plus, it's also uh, the 10-year anniversary of Firefox. Before we get to that, though, I'd like to thank DigitalOcean. They're our first sponsor this week. Head over to DigitalOcean.com right now and use our promo code UNPLUGGED November when you check out to get a $10 credit. Now, DigitalOcean is only $5 a month for their droplets. So that's going to get you a droplet for two months for free to try them out. Now, why would you go over to DigitalOcean? My friends, I will tell you, because they rock. It's simple cloud hosting, and they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. I got an email today from Jason who got started in 33 seconds. Uh, but they say on average you probably get going about 55 seconds or so, and pricing plans start at $5 per month. Their pricing structure is very logical. It incrementally goes up. You get all of the more of the things. It's very clearly laid out. They even have hourly pricing if you just need to do some testing. But for $5, you're going to get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer connected to tier one bandwidth at some of the world's most amazing data centers. You can see some of the awesome pictures on their Instagram feed. I'm super jelly. It's one thing I really miss about working in IT is the really awesome data centers. And they have locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. Multiple data centers. You can do private networking. It's really sophisticated stuff. And they manage it all with this dashboard. It is amazing. The dashboard is super intuitive. The control panel is one of these things that I, I wish I could just take it and like make it my idea because I would, I would just take this alone and make this the product, and I would become super rich. That's how incredible it is, and this is just part of DigitalOcean. And they wrap up all of these great features, like the ability to do one-click application deployments, or if perhaps you want to do something like DNS management, or a backup, or a one-click install of GitLab. You can do all of that right from the dashboard. It's super slick. And when you're over there, use our promo code Unplug November to get a $10 credit and try it out for a couple of months for free. And DigitalOcean is also looking for folks to write tutorials. They'll pay up to $200. So if there's something you're an expert on, go write a tutorial for them, and you might get paid. They have editors that will work with you. In fact, they even have an open editor position right now for those tutorials. So you, you, could, you might be able to get a job over DigitalOcean, too, if you want to edit some tutorials. That'd be pretty cool. So go over to DigitalOcean.com and use the promo code UNPLUGNOVEMBER when you check out. Try them out. This is pretty great. I've got, I got Craig Cray droplets. I got so many droplets now that Rikai has got droplets on my account. That's, I got, Rikai's got droplets now. How cool is that, right? And he's doing, you better watch out though, because I think he might be using it to develop Skynet. So you probably want to get on his good side. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code Unplugged November when you check out. And a huge thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Okay, so let's start off by saying happy 10th anniversary to Firefox, right? Version like 1.0 came out 10 years ago. They had a big old ad. Didn't they have a, didn't, isn't that, am I right? They bought a big ad in like the New York Times or something? I think so, yeah, if I remember correctly. It is pretty cool. And they, as part of that, uh, they've released a new uh, developer version of the browser, Aurora. They've taken the Aurora name, and now it's sort of like a, it's a development release with a bunch of tools and a new theme. I downloaded and tried it out last night. Uh, they also uh, introduced a new feature in Firefox called Forget. So instead of having to go into an entire uh, private session, you can just forget the last hour or 24 hours or whatever, five minutes 
of your browsing sessions. Kind of neat. They're also launching uh, Project Polaris, a privacy initiative, and to kick that off, they're starting with a massive boost to the Tor relay network to give Tor more capacity. And they're pledging to make security management simpler and more straightforward in Firefox. So a pretty cool 10th anniversary for Firefox. So uh, last week, well, I don't remember exactly even how it went down. On the pre-show, we uh, were like, it, somehow it came up that I run Chrome. I, Chromium, I should say. I don't actually run Chrome because it's just a little bit more of a pain in the ass to get on Arch. Uh, so I run Chromium. And uh, I'm, I, I, I like it a lot as far as a browser goes. It has issues. I think it's too resource intensive. And uh, I'm also not a huge fan of some of, the, some of the ways that Google seems to use it to push an agenda. This is super nitpicky. But like today on all my computers, I fired up Chrome for the first time in a week. And it's kind of like a welcome back. It's like all my computers are spamming me to donate to Ebola. Now, it's a good cause. But, like, my browser should not be used as a platform for Google to deliver me messages like that, right? And I'm not super comfortable with that kind of thing. And that's happening in Chromium. Uh, and the other thing about it is I don't like the IE factor that Chrome is starting to enjoy. Uh, you know, you're seeing new services that launch that require Chrome. I think we probably, at least all of us have seen that at least once. Google's own inbox product that they just launched only works in Chrome. Um, so these, these are some of the reasons. Uh, I also am a big fan of the Mozilla Foundation. I like that they push forward an open web platform. Uh, and I think that they're, you know, as far as their interests are more in line with end users' interests than Google's probably are. So I'm a fan of Firefox all around. I, I mean, I, I have used Firefox literally since the day the project was born, right? I mean, I, I remember before there was a Firefox. I remember after Firefox. I mean, I'm really a big fan of Firefox. I don't think you gave it enough. Never a chance. Uh, no, so, just kidding, I'm joking. I mean, I literally, I mean, I remember, I remember when 1.0 shipped. I clearly remember I, the day. Me too, man. Me too. Uh, and it was a really big deal because it took a very long time, it felt like, to get there. At least back then, it felt and like. And it was a huge, it was a huge, huge deal. There was, it was yeah. a totally yeah. different. Yeah, and this is really, it was a big deal. And this was really before. People talked online, like in like social, in like a social way. Like there was message forms and and BBSs, and there was uh, like there was discussion yeah, yeah. forums. But there wasn't like we don't have like this instant buzz about things like we have today, right. where like the Gnome Foundation can raise like a ton of money in like 24 hours. Like we don't have that level of connectivity. But even back then, we were all buzzing about Firefox 1.0. Oh, it was a huge deal because like the alternatives were like Mosaic, Netscape, and yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it was like a horribly ugly GTK application back then, too. Oh, Super ugly, really bad. Uh, but you know what? Rocked it. Loved it. It was the best browser ever. It really was. It was so much better than Internet Explorer for a long time. Uh, so, but at some much, point, yeah. yeah, I know, but at some point, I'm just kidding. I, I switched over to Chrome, um, you know, just to try it out, I guess. And I found myself pretty happy, and I found extensions that work really well for me. On the pre-show, though, people are like, Chris, why are you using Chrome? You should switch over to Firefox. And everybody ganged up on me. And I finally caved right as the show started and said, all right, I'll try <laughs> Firefox out for a week. And a few other folks joined me on the challenge, and uh, we have some of them on the show here today. And, in fact, we also heard from uh, just people in the audience that were taking the challenge. Now, uh, whom in the chat room, Matt, managed to go out and collect the moments... Uh, that uh, throughout the whole week, I've been using Firefox. And throughout the whole week, different moments on air, my browser has crashed on me and left me <laughs> stranded in the middle of a show. <laughs> Whom was polite yeah. enough to go out and collect some of those for us. So I'll start oh, with probably God. the one that was the most egregious. We're paying the bills. We're about to watch Kyra's app pick. And Firefox all crashes all on us. Here's calls the clip. That I get from the ladies who just want to hear my voice. Oh, yeah. Let's find totally. out. Here we go. No, you cannot speak to Kira Longfield. No, I don't need duck cleaning. I'm Kyra and this thing's app of the week. Uh oh. Hold on, Matt. Uh -oh. Hold on, Firefox crash. The app was so so no, awesome. No, it just, it's, like, completely... it's not Kyra's fault. It's <laughs> totally Firefox crashing on me. Hold on, let's play it again. Go! But, but, Kyra, go! go. All right, so the, okay, all right, so there was uh, there was crash uh, number one. Here it was uh, crash number two in the same old, episode, and he launched an, a user friendly system based on Arch. And I want to play a little bit of his Kickstarter video from that effort, so that way for some of you who might oh Firefox killing me. really Firefox seriously killing me. Firefox. Now theoretically it should be oh remember man. Right. So the Firefox crash is right there as uh, I'm trying to seek in the video again. You might notice a theme here. Uh, it was another Flash video. Now I actually haven't seen uh, the rest of these clips yet. I don't remember these, but here was another example of Firefox crashing on air. Hey yeah. Firefox. <laughs> 
How do you people use Firefox? <laughs> Look at how it's rendering it's, my it's Google Plus It's page. great as long as you're not doing anything with Google. Or <laughs> Look whatever. at, oh yeah, that's right. That was when it totally, that's when it totally misrendered the uh, Google Plus page when I was trying to talk about System76. Uh, all right, so then finally somebody catches me. I show now, my extensions. I, 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 change I have a lot of extensions, but oh I do. Oh my it. God. <laughs> Dude, how is your browser even run? <laughs> <laughs> Fudge, <laughs> fucking far, far, far. But here's the wow. thing. All right, so I did have a lot of extensions. Uh, just a couple, just a couple. Uh, but yeah, so there, uh, so they crashed. So they also crashed during uh, Tech Talk today on me uh, a couple of times. So it's been a pretty rough week. Not only did it, not only was stability an issue, but also just the same extension selection wasn't really available. Now, does that mean Firefox is horrible? I don't think so, but. I don't know. Like a, a lot of people said, "Oh, Chris, it's your extensions," or "Chris, it's this or that." Um, and I, I, mm. I, 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 it was I, you know going through it. I just thought to myself, "Well, doesn't at the end of the day really matter how the browser handles a catastrophe? Like if you if if an extension craps the bed, well, bad on that extension, but even worse on the browser for totally dumping out, right? Because that's what not, that's totally. not what Chrome does, right? So I, I, I don't know. I, I so I don't want to get too far into it. First, I want to ask Popey, Popey. I know you've been working with it for a week. You're still in the Firefox challenge mode right now. How are you doing? Are you going to stick with it for another week? So to be fair, uh, it's worth noting that we've been shipping Firefox since Ubuntu 4.10, which was 10 years ago. And we shipped Firefox 0.99 in our first release of Ubuntu. And it's been the default browser for every single release of Ubuntu since then. Okay. However, <laughs> uh, I I I have flip flopped between various browsers for years, and I think uh, we came to a mutual decision last week to um, both try a week of Firefox because we've both been using Chromium or Chrome mostly. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, I I, um, I I have everything installed, even Midori. From time to time, I use that for like a right, Gmail and, login or something. Right, and so and and I've always had Firefox inside. I've never uninstalled it. I'm not one of those people who are zealous and sure. will like remove any apps that I don't use by default. But I, so I, I've been using Chromium, and there's a couple of things that I liked about Chromium and Chrome that I've been using. So I switched to Firefox a week ago, and actually, whilst I've been bitching and moaning, the two things that have annoyed me most was the fact that it slowed down dramatically and ate all my CPUs and all my RAM. And, and I, I, I'm on a laptop with an i7 CPU and 16 gig of RAM, and it ate it all up. Um, with And I wasn't, I, I only have two extensions installed. Two. Oh. And I, at the time when it ate all my RAM, I, I had like half a dozen tabs open. So I'm not, normally in Chrome or Chromium, I will have... 50 60 maybe 100 tabs open and if it starts eating my cpu i'll be like okay i'm being a bit of a dick with my browser now and i'll close some of the tabs but or uh chromium will do that for me and it will start killing off tabs yeah uh when it you know it has a bad did day. you have any crashing and fair enough did you have any uh, crashing firefox like yeah uh, nothing like you had i had a couple of occasions this week where my entire laptop rebooted um, and I've not had that for some time, but I can't pin that on Firefox. Sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it's actually an Intel video driver problem, and I have filed that, and that's an upstream bug. Right. Um, but the, the the problems I've had is more slowness and um, eating all my resources. However, I think it's mostly down to the fact that I tend to leave my laptop running. I I rarely restart the browser. I just shut the lid suspend it, wake it up, and carry on. Hmm. And I think on my system, Firefox doesn't like being left running for a very long period of time, like days. Hmm. All right, so Wimpy, what was... I know you kind of had a similar path. What did you do exactly? Did you Were you a Chromium user that tried Firefox for a while, or vice versa? The other way around. So actually, I, I adopted um, Chrome really early on. So very early on in sort of the alpha beta stage in around 2008. And that was because it had a really nifty uh, JavaScript JIT compiler at the time, which we needed to test some prototype code on for work. 
Um, so for work, I work with aircraft and uh, aircraft data, and we wanted to plot thousands of samples of aircraft data in a browser. Mm. And yeah. you simply couldn't do that back then. And right. suddenly Chrome turned up and it, it changed the game. Yeah. So ever since then, I've been using Chrome because I started using it and I, I went through the growing pains and I sort of stuck with it. But about a year ago, I noticed Chrome rendering popular websites in strange ways. So I started using Firefox and then I just switched back to Firefox. So I've been using Firefox exclusively for about 12 months. And to be honest with you, other than the rendering problems that I'd had with Chrome previously, um, I couldn't really tell anything between the two browsers. But I thought I'd take a closer look as you were doing this this week. And I've had a chat with Popey in the week. And running Firefox and Chrome side by side, what I definitely notice is Chrome is significantly faster than Firefox. And I didn't believe Popey when he was telling me the subjective metrics about mm -hmm. how much faster it was. So I went off and uh, I did it properly. I know, right? You know. I'm a big fat liar, aren't I? <laughs> Well, no, I just, I just, I'm just sceptical by nature, I suppose. But I, I went away and did some tests. And, and whilst, whilst you do these browser benchmarks that kind of mean something, if you actually run the two browsers side by side, you can see the difference. And it was when I could see the difference in the rendering time and the smoothness and the transition. And it, it, it was quicker and i just felt like i was in better control of the browser right and um, i also feel like the ui yeah. responds faster like tabs open and close faster like it's not struggling to to open that tab up if there's something else going on in the browser Whereas exactly sometimes exactly. i feel like firefox is struggling with that and like there's only yes. one or two worker it's threads and, yeah yeah so well you know chrome, chrome and chromium have some tricks that they play that make it look faster than it really is. I think but, so, yeah. But, but it works, that's fine. It? I don't, I don't then, care if they're but, tricks. But, but, as long as they're tricks not, that yeah, fool my well, eyes. Right. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's not just what you see. When I ran the various browser benchmarks, Chrome you know, on my system was, was beating Firefox two times over every time. Really? Was that from a startup or no, after running, you had a bunch so of stuff cat? Sorry, there's a the, – yes, so from startup, go to the same benchmark site, run the benchmark, and re post the results. So the conditions were the same. Okay, good. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, here's – now, a couple other things, just anecdotal. Just my experiences. Um, uh, so day one we didn't go super great. Firefox Sync, for some reason, just go figure, right, didn't actually sync on the – I had a new install, set up the browser – uh, logged into Firefox Sync on the browser the night before, went about, did some web reading, probably used the browser for about an hour, closed it, came back, moved my lap, brought my Bonobo to the studio, opened it up, launched Firefox like around 8.30, then went on air around 9. So, uh, And then I go to start the show and realize that none of my bookmarks had synced, none of my extensions had oh. synced. Yeah, and that was a little like, oh, man, day one I got burned by sync. Yeah. Uh, but I was able to, if I, but then, so to fix it, I had to delete my profile and then create a new profile and then set up sync again. Same account, then sync just worked. Not a huge deal. Uh, but what, what I walked away from is uh, when I would run into issues, so a couple of things would happen. Uh, it, people would, uh, well, actually, I guess I, I have a clip of it here. I, I might, I'm going to play this clip from last. It might be a little ranty, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it from the heat of the moment and I'll uh, see if this covers what I was just about to say. <laughs> oh, you need to be able to copy that as HTML? Just install. So how yep. the conversation yeah. literally started was, Chris, just install an extension to have it have the same features as Chrome. Right. You need that thing that Chrome can do? Yep. Just install. So the conversation starts. This is Chris, just install an extension. And now, now the conversation is, Chris, you got too many extensions. Yeah. What do you expect to happen? So <laughs> So I can't use the browser because I don't have an extension. And then once I yeah. have too many extensions, now the problem is I've got too many extensions. And well, it's yeah. literally gone from Tuesday to Chris, install an extension. And all literally, people yeah. were so determined that I install extensions that they literally, between Tuesday and today, yep. developed extensions yep, yep, for yep, me. Yep, yep, yep. Created extensions. Yeah. I've installed those extensions. They're great. They make yeah. they add, but now it's Chris. You got too many extensions. Now, now on the other side of that, Chrome, oh. Chrome is a big bloated turd biscuit. I mean, it's it's like it literally it just starts processes to piss me off. I hate Chrome. I hate it with a passion. I want to light it on I fire know, and me too. burn it. That's you know, thing is, I don't so, like Chrome. I so, don't like it. <laughs> I I literally I found I use a little bit of Midori. I, you know, I use some other browsers and, and but generally for like just casual, I'm doing random stuff on the internet. I use Firefox because it's great for. All right, so I got to install. But I use, you know, but I 
used to GST. Yeah. So what I found was uh, I found like people were like super willing to like constantly volunteer things I should do. Like a lot of go into your about config and change this, uh, yeah. enable hardware acceleration, disable hardware acceleration, install this extension. Oh yeah, that extension that you needed. That well, that only goes in the status bar. Well, the status bar doesn't actually exist anymore. So now you have to install an extension that brings back the status bar. And then once you bring back the status bar, you can customize the status bar and take the button out of the status bar and move it up to the menu bar and then uninstall that extension and then go install this extension so that way it, it's like it was ongoing and then when I started having stability issues which were clearly related to the Adobe Flash plugin not yeah, related exactly. to extend the other extensions right. clearly related to the Adobe Flash plugin but immediately it's well you have too many extensions you need to do this you're yeah. doing this wrong and it, it, it sort of immediately went hostile and what yeah, I started thinking exactly. about was People that are switching to Linux, they have these problems in a much broader context with all kinds of little pain points when they switch over to Linux. And I also see the same kind of, well, what do you mean it's not working for you? Well, then you're doing it wrong. And I got emails where people critiqued my technical literacy because it's not that Firefox was having issues. It's not that it wasn't properly handling when the when the flash plugin crashed or whatever was happening. What the problem was is I wasn't technically literate to use the browser and I didn't care enough about open source. I, yeah. I probably got I probably got nearly a hundred comments to that regard, and it's See, it's ridiculous. It's, and not only is it ridiculous, it's 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 antithetical to everything that I used to know about Foss. Anyways, I want people to just to consider it. Like, it, here, I think what we have to get better at, and I know this is maybe a soapbox of mine, but I think what we have to get better at is acknowledging that everything has strengths and attributes to it. Like, I like I started this segment talking about what I like about Firefox, the history I have with it, and why the Mozilla Foundation is great. I also use Firefox on every computer I have, but my primary get work done browser has to remain, in my opinion, Chrome. And I think the bigger problem here is, is that what we are really beginning to see is the division that Mozilla is actually up against, which is not Firefox versus Internet Explorer or Firefox versus Chrome. It is Firefox versus every single other WebKit browser on the market because application developers are writing WebKit first. They're not necessarily even writing Chrome first. They're writing WebKit first. Then they might specifically maybe write Chrome first. And that's what Firefox's real challenge is at their 10-year mark going forward now, is their lunch is getting eaten, eaten by WebKit. WebKit is the winning team right now. And, and Firefox oh. needs to have an answer to that. And I understand electrolysis is a thing that's coming that's going to make Firefox super more amazing, and it's not going to crash as much. But it's, it honestly, to me, it feels too late, and it, it makes me sad a little bit. It doesn't mean it's going away. It doesn't mean it's a bad browser. It doesn't mean it's not going to get way more awesome. It doesn't mean that the Mozilla Foundation isn't incredible. It doesn't mean you're a bad person for wanting to use Firefox, and I'm a bad person for wanting to use Chromium, though. Yes, they are. To be fair to Google, they're actually removing the WebKit-centric stuff because they don't want people to do that. So that's why Blink has removed all of the WebKit uh, CSS com uh, commands and stuff that are specific to WebKit. Because really? people were doing that and breaking stuff in Opera and Firefox at the time, and they and Google didn't want to create breakage; they wanted standardization. Of course. So Blink has that stuff gone. Hmm. Huh. Very good. Uh, by the way, I uh, I looked into uh, uh, actually Rikai hooked me up with the info, uh, but I read through the info on Chromium versus Chrome, and it seems like Wikipedia maybe has one of the best breakdowns. There's several. Even Google even has their own wiki page on it, but. Uh, uh, Wikipedia. So here's a couple of things. So by the way, I'm a Chromium user. Chromium is an open source project. It's BSD licensed. There's other components that have different licensing. It's got a lot of little, little uh, uh, asterisks at the end of that. But there, it. So it's that was the other thing is people were kind of jumping on me for using another open source project. But either way, uh, there is a couple of things that Chromium does not have that I think people should consider if they were going to try. Uh, the print subsystem apparently is different in the final Chrome version. In Chromium, it'll hand it, it'll hand it off to your operating system. But in Chrome, they, they're using like the entire Google print subsystem, which ties in with the Google Cloud print and all of that. Uh, of course, no ACC built in, so it's going to have to rely on your operating system codecs. Uh, the tracking is opt-in in Chromium versus opt-on, I guess, in regular Chrome. I might have that wrong, but it's definitely opt-in in Chromium. Uh, and no auto update features, so you're going to have to rely on your package manager, which I prefer to have my package manager do that anyway, so that's fine with me. And of course, the integrated Sorry, what's flash got no player. auto update? Uh, Google Chromium doesn't use the Google updater, it uses your operating system's package manager. Like it should. Uh, okay. And uh, no built in flash. So no AAC, no built in flash, uh, no Google updater, and no Google so from, Cloud Print. From 
from the Ubuntu point of view, they're both those are both the same. They both come yeah, as Debian packages from an archive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One comes from yeah. the Ubuntu archive. Right. One comes from a Debian, uh, a, Google a Google archive one, yeah. somewhere. It yeah. doesn't have the uh, media multimedia extension either. Oh, yeah. oh Chris, that's Netflix. a good point. Yes, that's a good one. And also, uh, uh, it's being pointed out that no remote desktop either, which is a great point Chris. there, Dublin. Yeah, go ahead. Chris, um, the reason you're getting hate for using Chromium is because you keep accidentally calling it Chrome. Well, I kind of, I kind of use both, so I kind of interchange them depending. You know, I mean, I primarily use Chromium on the majority because it's a little bit quicker to install on an Archbox. But yeah, and people tend to get a little bit funny about you know, when whenever I've said uh, I'm using Chromium, the the question that always follows is, do you mean Chrome? Or if I say oh, I'm yeah, using Chrome, is. they ask, yeah. do you mean Chromium? Yeah. It's like no, I, I'm you know I'm 42. I've managed to yeah, differentiate between Chrome and Chromium. If I'm talking about Chrome, I'll say Chrome. If I'm talking about Chromium, I'll say Chromium. I, uh, but <laughs> sometimes you want to talk about both together because collectively Chrome and Chromium are very similar code bases. I find uh, I find it, yeah, to be pretty similar, but uh, to me, I, I what this was really revealing to is just how freaking important the web browsers become in my workflow. Not only do I use it to show most of the visuals in all of our shows, but the research and the, the pipeline of a lot of our media management and all of it is just browser-based now. Uh, so it's... Uh, Thankfully, like I, I felt like at the end of this, if Chrome or Chromium went away tomorrow, like I, I would be okay. I would make do, especially since the community was pretty awesome and like there was a couple of user extensions that were, uh, uh, you know, use Grease Monkey and then add a user script to that, and they wrote a couple of those for me to do Markdown stuff. And it actually, so I mean, there would be ways around it. Uh, so the thing I've learned about this is yeah. that there are people who are exceedingly passionate about Firefox. Yes, and they want me to have a good experience on Firefox. So rather than dismiss this whole experiment and go back to using Chromium as I did, I'm going to stick with Firefox. I've removed Flash from my system, so I'm doing everything I can to avoid Flash-based mm, yeah. websites or Flash streaming video, which means your website, actually, Chris, you need to provide an easy way for me to be able to watch the live stream without Flash, right? That's on you, okay? Um, but... <laughs> Well, why don't you that, just why don't you just grab the uh, just grab the RTSP, RTMP or RTSP, RTSP or RTMP? Yeah, yeah. Okay, HLS. I'll do that. Yeah, I'll, so I'll whatever. try that instead. Yeah, because the, there's <laughs> not really a, there's not really an embeddable open source live stream solution. But no, no, I don't, I don't mind having a, uh, not having an embeddable. Do you thing. have I, NPV? I'd like a URL somewhere that I could paste into. Oh, I actually yeah, used a a, a a nice um, tool that um, one of the other guys in the mumble mentioned earlier called Livestreamer. Yes, uh, but that yeah. didn't find any embeddable. Um, so streams to to watch from your page. Grab the RTMP link or RTSP. I don't remember which one it is. Okay, I'll and try that. And then if you oh, have MPV or a VLC, but MPV is really great. Uh, you just do MPV and then the URL, and uh, it'll fire up. You know what we should do is like a short, like we have jblive.fm for the audio stream. I should do something like that for the. That would be a great yes, idea because yeah, totally then you should. can just tell people to go to it. I'll yep. think about it. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, yeah, because that is a problem, and we get that comment all the time. And of course, the whole website is all HTML5 video except for. The live stream, and it's really you can thank HLS and H.264 for that. It's, it's kind of like, uh, sickingly enough, Flash is one of the best assemblers of HLS video on the market, as dis disgusting as that is. And uh, you, you know, you can throw it on a new iPhone six or a Nexus five, and they will struggle to do as well of a job as Flash can do for whatever reason. Alan could, could, could talk to you all day about it, but it really comes down to the fact that the standards we use for video streaming right now super suck. Uh, but we've just kind yeah. of moved, fat, moved ahead with it. There's also a Jupyter Broadcasting XBMC add-on that you could use. Yeah, and if you watch on a Roku, uh, there's a there's a Jupyter oh, yeah. Broadcasting app I and the live streams that. on that. Yeah, I watch it. And, and I could watch on my tablet yeah. or you yeah. know something else like that. Yeah, that that's not a problem. But so I'm, I'm going to try and stick with Firefox, mm. and I'm going to take advice from various people in the Mumble channel who've suggested ways in which I can. Uh, debug the issues and make sure that I follow them upstream and ensure the experience is better for everyone else as well. Yeah. So my my thoughts would be yeah, like I would go yeah. the uh, I would go the no flash route for sure. Yeah. Uh, but I can't because of some of the media management I have for JB. But I was thinking I I've tried running in terminal and stuff like that to get some output, but I didn't really get anything very beneficial. But my thought was to experiment around a little bit more because I I know exactly what conditions caused it to crash because I could repeat it over and over again. See if I can get it to do it and then. Maybe as a 10th birthday present to Firefox, I'll send off a few bug reports over the weekend. 
So Chris, <laughs> you're such a nice man, right? <laughs> See if maybe it's we all can about get the something. charity, man. That's yeah. right. Hey, happy birthday, guys! Here's some bugs. <laughs> 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 all right, uh, so uh, we got to talk about boy. Oh my gosh, we've really got to get going because uh, we have some really exciting stuff uh, to talk about. Wimpy's going to share something awesome, uh, and we've also, you know what? I don't think the the gnome Groupon thing will take too long, but we've got to talk about it. Just real quick, but before we do that, I want to thank Ting. Go over to linux.ting.com right now, everybody. linux.ting.com. That'll take $25 off your first Ting device. Or if you have a Ting-compatible device, they'll give you $25 credit. linux.ting.com. What? what you, don't, you don't know what Ting is? What is the matter with you? Ting is mobile that makes sense. No contracts, no early termination fees. You only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 for your line. And then whatever your usage is, that's what you pay. And you want another phone? It's six dollars. You want another phone? It's you could be a baller like me. I've got three phones and I'm up here and I'm paying like forty five bucks. But then when I go out and I show the ladies all my phones, they're like, "That's so impressive with all your phones. Why do you have so many phones?" And I tell them I have Ting. Linux.ting.com. Go check them out. No hold customer service. Yeah, that's another peak uh, perk. You don't have to wait for a human. You just call them up and they answer it. You don't have a phone tree. You don't have to leave a voicemail. You don't have to know like some sort of secret zero smashing sequence to get to an operator. They just answer the phone. If you call them between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. on the East Coast, it's great. And then they match it all up with a fantastic dashboard and an awesome online community. Uh, but this week, I wanted to do something a little different. You know, in last, we'll often do an app pick video. Uh, but, you know, app pick, schmap picks. This is Linux Unplugged. Let's go deep into the development world. Uh, they have a video up of talking with carry the behind the scenes interview with their lead web developer and uh, I want to play a little bit of it because I'm playing it in Chromium. My name is Carrie and I am the interface developer at Ting. My role at Ting is to develop and maintain any customer facing side of our website including WordPress and Facebook. Usually we'll start with a discussion, product management will come over or ask us if what they want is feasible or how much time it'll take and I will give them an answer, it'll take 10 minutes or it'll take six years, sometimes it will take six years. And they go off on their own and come up with the designs and then they finally, when they give them to me, I set to work on making them a reality. Earlier this year we went responsive with our design. What this means is that when users browse our website on a smaller screen, like a phone or an iPod, they're going to see a different design than if they see it on a big screen like a desktop. We're making sure that users get the best possible experience on all device sizes. It feels really good to be able to be part of something that even our senior citizens can browse comfortably, because I mean, a lot of senior citizens aren't that comfortable with the internet, and then we get comments from them saying, thanks for making it so easy, and that is a really rewarding part of this job. Linux.ting.com. Go over there and start saving right now. They also have a savings calculator. Uh, I've been uh, not quite yet, but I am nearing the two-year mark. It is approaching, and uh, the final savings will be over $2,000 for me. So why not get started right now? Linux.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the Linux Unplug show. Okay, guys. Uh, let's talk. Uh, let's do a brief uh, update because maybe... The real story might actually develop by the time Linux Action Show comes around, but you probably saw the headline today. The Gnome Foundation is attempting to raise some funds to help defend Gnome's trademark against Groupon. Yeah, the uh, the uh, yeah Groupon the uh, coupon company. Uh, they have raised sixty-eight thousand dollars as of well, pretty much this 68? morning. Sixty-eight thousand bucks. Uh, Groupon has also, re yeah, 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 and Groupon's already responded saying, "Hey, dog, uh, look, uh, we're sorry. We don't want to use anybody's name." And after additional conversations with the open source community and the Gnome Foundation, we've decided to abandon our pending trademark application for oh, Gnome. God. We've chosen a new name for our product going forward. So Gnome was this retail box thing that they were gonna, so you could go buy coupons. Kind of a neat idea for Groupon, uh, but I. Uh, Right, Pope, you and I were talking about this on the uh, Tech Talk uh, pre-show today, or actually during the show. Am I missing any details at this point, or is that kind of the summary of where we're at? No, that seems to be it. It's all over. Let's start bashing System D again. Yeah, we're back to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Okay, war is over. But uh, it was fascinating to see the troops mobilized last night. So before I went to bed or something, I saw a tweet, or and then by the time I got up, the Google Pluses and the tweets and the, 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 the subreddit, every subreddit had it in there. Like It was full on fire this morning. Really when you say troops, 
you know, on a day like today where we're remembering real sacrifice right, I know. that real people have done. You are I taking my own point I made who... earlier and using it against me. You are a jerk, <laughs> sir. You are a jerk. I, <laughs> yeah. I think this week the witch I would not call those read it. Yes, I know. And that's kind of my point. Again, we were just, we were ready to go to war. We were ready to go to war. Every and and they raised a ton of money. I even I I threw I threw in fifty five bucks. I was like, well, all right. I I like no. I'm really surprised it's as low as that. I really thought they'd 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 have double that. So what happens with the money now? I mean, some people uh, very, it goes to making uh, gnome better. Okay. Yeah, they already said that it's going to go to gnome. Like anything that's left over, and since all of it's left over, all of it goes to gnome. So far, I yeah. I think that's worthy. Yeah, that's well, that's great because I know they've they've had some. Tr- They've had some financial troubles, right? Isn't that a thing? Oh, yeah. They yeah. they right. ended last year in the red. Well, I guess they just got a little revenue boost then. But I'm yeah. glad. I mean, uh, I think it's uh, I think it's also uh, what it really demonstrates legitimately is the serious uh, brand loyalty. I don't know if that's the right term to call it. But the, the lo- uh, I mean, people came to Gnome's defense in mass, and people... I think things have changed around, turned around for Gnome. I think the public opinion is turning on Gnome because people really, really seem to come out in defense of it, and we're ready to fight Groupon and calling them names. And Groupon really responded. Like, so not only did they have their official blog post, but like their senior lead engineer, and you know, I think that's actually his title, senior lead engineer, uh, went to his blog uh, trying to explain that you know it was a misunderstanding that they had been in communication with the Gnome Foundation and that you know they're willing to be flexible. Like they they really scrambled. I'm not really familiar I've seen comments with comments from the mm. from the gnome side saying we've been in conversation with them for months and yeah. it's only today so kind of justifying the whole public hatred of uh, of Groupon and people deleting their Groupon accounts. Uh, I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced that it was entirely down to the Reddit army and uh, <laughs> the various armies leaving comments everywhere that got this done. But I'm sure it was a contributing factor. Yeah. I'd I'd like to think that Groupon got a telephone call from Karen Sandler where she implied she was going to put the smack down on them in no uncertain That's terms. What I was and they realised yeah. what they were up against. <laughs> or maybe the people at Groupon grew a pair and realised that actually they were being dicks. And Doesn't, what they really exactly. needed to do was just <laughs> not do the thing that they were Doesn't, doing. Didn't someone who yeah. works at Groupon used to be... Someone who worked at Gnome. Oh, now this is a good rumor. Yeah, Ryan Cameron. Or even, or oh, even well. more interesting, maybe, is using this as a way to show that they now have a new product. Marketing. Everyone kind of knows that they have a, a point of sale system. You think that that All the boy, truthers are out there? Huh? Yeah, I yeah, would say that's n- a pretty obscure marketing it, though, strategy. Well, yeah. It will work, though. <laughs> like, everyone now knows what they have yeah. and might actually check it out. And I'm actually thinking it's kind of a good idea because I don't want to go sign up at Groupon, but if they had a kiosk where I could just do a one-time transaction, well, maybe I might do that. I mean, I'm a cheapskate after all. So They might even they might even look at, people might even look at gnome, the GNOME desktop environment now as well. Holy smokes, maybe they were in on it on the, from the first time. It's a false flag trademark dispute. <laughs> <laughs> you Operation know, promotion. I know, right? We gotta, you boy. If we're not careful, we're gonna have to uh, bust out the uh, conspiracy bacon on uh, this, on this edition of. Yeah, uh, yeah that's funny because that's exactly what Blue Phoenix was saying in the chat room a little bit ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that there was, it did smell a little bacony to him, and I, I don't think so. I don't think they'd be that dishonest. No, I don't think so either. No, it's a, it's. If a fun- they're not though. It's- kind of, you need to question if they're in conversations in months. Why do you add applications? Doesn't make sense. Because lawyers do stuff without being told. Yeah, I could see that, or uh, like, uh, the, or maybe the negotiations weren't necessarily going the known project's direction, so they went public to, uh, you know, show their serious commitment. I mean, there could be all kinds of scenarios. Who knows? Uh, okay. You guys are lovely and just in, uh, in huge good faith. Yeah, I suppose. Uh, all right, I, I, I can't hold it any longer. We got to talk about something super exciting. Really, really happy. But really quickly, we're going to thank Linux Academy. Uh, I've got a note uh, from uh, Anthony, who uh, is one of the guys that runs Linux Academy. And uh, he said that they've gotten a ton of new signups from the uh, Linux Unplugged audience. And the feedback's been unanimously awesome. Um, and when I went to Ohio Linux Fest, Shook a lot of hands from folks that are taking courses at Linux Academy, and they've been really impressed. And they say one of the things that's kind of hard to understand about Linux Academy is you really grok how great it is and how it really is a solution tailored 
for Linux users by Linux users, right? And that is so key because there's a lot of online learning resources. Uh, and you really, you really see the difference if you're trying to go for something in this space, something about Linux or AWS or OpenStack and DevOps and Android development. They've really nailed this, right? Because that's what these guys do. That's, that's their area, and they can really get it right. They are these users. They're sysadmins, Linux users, developers, and educators that came together to create Linux Academy. You can go over to linuxacademy.com slash unplugged and get our special 33% discount on your quarter. It's a great service. And once you sign up, you get access to all of the courseware. You get the downloadable comprehensive study guides. You get to take those online or offline. You can do the learning plans where they'll, you can say, I have just this amount of time available. Plug it in there. They'll generate you a learning courseware on that with reminders about quizzes, checkups, when you log in, you choose your you choose your course, and it lays it all out for you. It maps it all out, and it's super easy to manage. They have a good active community that can keep you going when you're having a low moment, and they have live streams where you can ask questions to the educators. Their labs spin up on demand when the courseware requires it, and they're adding new courses every single week. They've got a whole bunch more they just put out. And that's why you want to just keep going there all the time, because you can keep going back and learn something new, see what scratches that itch, bring yourself a little bit further in something you've been working on. I use it, honestly, just to see if some of the same old technologies that used to be a problem for me still are a problem, to see if I have maybe a new peak, peaked in a new interest, something I want to build for JB. There's all kinds of things. Uh, we, they also have group plans, so we can have folks in the Jupiter Broadcasting community that work here that have to do something. Maybe we have them go over there, and they can log in under the group course. It's all part of one set under one organization. It's really neat. They're adding stuff, too. You've got to go check it out, because I, I can't say what it is, but I've been given a little hint, and... It just really, it really underscores that this is a product that's made by Linux users, for Linux users. And when you're trying to learn some of these things, that, that is the differential that really closes the gap. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go check them out. PHP, Android development, Ruby, Python, Linux, DevOps, AWS with scenario-based training. They got it all. Rsync even. You need to go learn how to do your backups with Rsync. They got a course on that. I'm telling you, it's worth checking them out. Linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. So I was noticing on uh, Google Plus that, uh, Wimpy, you posted that you guys are getting a little attention over in Germany in one of their uh, newspaper. Or I'm sorry, it's a magazine, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. So um, there's a quarterly Linux publish pop uh, publication in Germany called uh, Linux Welt. I think that's how it's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, it's got a circulation of about fifty to 60,000. And they're including and then, DVDs. Yeah, and they have DVD cover discs. And for the um, uh, 2015-01 edition, which I think is out next week, uh, Ubuntu Mate is the feature story and the cover disc. That is so cool. And uh, so that's not just the announcement, though. You actually, you've been working on a little something. We, we talked about it uh, kind of recently. And so I know you're, you're, you're getting near. I've, I'm teasing it off a lot, Wimpy. What, are, what, what process are we about to go through right now? Right. Okay. So uh, everyone probably knows uh, that's listening to this that Ubuntu Mate 14.10 was released a couple of weeks ago, and we've been preparing an Ubuntu Mate 14.04 release. And I'm actually re ready to go through the keystrokes to release it live now. So we're going to release the latest version, which is based on 14.04, right here. That's on right. Air. Let's do it. Let's right do here it. on air. So this okay, is so this is fun. So I've got my Terminator sessions open, and I've logged into my two digital ocean build servers. This is where I prepare the ISO images. I've already prepared the images, and I'm going to run the release scripts. And the release scripts build the WebSeed torrents, actually make the ISOs from the SquashFS, add the assets from the official Ubuntu uh, CD releases, and then R-sync them to my distribution servers. So we'll do that now. So, uh, off we go. Right, so that's the power of DigitalOcean. That's just shunted six gigabytes of data. Really? Wow. We'll now um, just edit the release flag on the article. Now we'll run the deploy script. This is so exciting. <laughs> I know, right? I know. This wow. is actually the geekiest thing I think so, we've ever done on the show, and I love it. So the deploy script uh, basically takes all the markdown that uh, the site is generated from and turns it into HTML. So that's done. So now I go to my CDN, 
and I prefetch all of those images into the CDN and that's done and now I purge the blog index from my Cloudflare in uh, and that just makes sure that the updates go through and I think we're done. <laughs> So, so you do the web witness to a lopper on operating system being released live. So you push the whole website and everything in that. Yeah, there you go. So if you go to Ubuntu Mate org slash blog, the article that you'll see now is the release notes and the article. So and if you go to I'll, Ubuntu Mate org slash download. Uh, yes, that that should redirect. I think because there's uh, there's two yeah. uh, two bits in there. You know what, Wimpy? You just earned yourself. Very nice, sir. Very nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good awesome. work. Wow. Amazing. So now, so I would, I would just, I would just like to rattle off this. Yes. There's a few people I'd like to say thank you to. Once, some bloke called Alan Pope, uh, Sandra <laughs> Swears, who's one of the Mate developers, who worked really hard on fixing the accessibility stuff. Uh, Mike Gabriel, who's a Debian developer, he helped an awful lot in this release. Uh, Gerard Alders, who provided one of the new backdrop images. Some bloke called Michael Tunnel or Tunnel, I don't know how you pronounce your name, but Rotten Corpse, he's one of the guys here. He did the new icon theme. Uh, Luke Velvich, Kendall Clark, Kyle Bruard, and Rob White, who represent various um, distributions that are focused towards the blind or partially sighted, who mm. helped fix all of the all of the screen reading stuff. Wow. Great, you guys. And and one of the things that's interesting is you were mentioning before, it's based on Ubuntu 14.04, but yet it actually has some maybe what you might call improvements or feature enhancements over the one based on 14.10, right? Indeed. So um, Rotten Corpse has tweaked the theme for us, which looks nicer. We've got an, an, a new wallpaper. Uh, we've fixed the multicast DNS. Uh, we've fixed policy kit privileges. We've uh, The big, big feature items are we've added indicator support. So now you can add indicators into the Mate desktop, and they sit side oh, by side oh. with traditional tray applets no. as well. Wow. Yeah. That's um, a win. Yeah, you like that, do you? I like that <laughs> a lot, actually. Okay. I'm just yeah. impressed of how fast that blog post went out. <laughs> 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 no, what you need to be inf impressed with is how fast we just pushed 18 gigabytes of data around the internet. Yeah. Yeah, that, as well. Yeah, and you, that's and that's all down to DigitalOcean. You said you you said it would take about five minutes. Uh, it took about yeah. two minutes. It was yeah. Yeah, I was I was hedging it on me. Yeah. But bum bungling it and having to redo bits. Um, a couple of other bits we've added is um, the, the Mint menu I forked as the Mate menu, which is available in this release because nice. lots of people are after that. And I've actually done that for the X to go guys because they want a menu where they can disable uh, log out and um, suspend features because of remote workstations. That doesn't make sense. Uh, I've also forked the Mint desktop utility as Mate Tweak or Mate Tweak to um, just access some of the behind the scenes bits and pieces um and then what else have we done accessibility that's where we spent a lot of time fixing up accessibility oh yeah oh this is a good one um we've ditched totem as the default media player and placed it with vlc nice very nice Beautiful. Um, we ran a we ran a community poll for that and that was unanimously voted for so we've made that change so i think eric you've got kind of a probably a popular question yeah, since it's based on 1404, is this going to be basically an LTS as far as you can do it? Yes. So we obviously don't have to maintain the base OS. I hope you can probably tell you more about what goes on with that. Um, but in terms of the PPX, because this is an unofficial release, this is you know built outside of Canonical's infrastructure, so there's no official support there. But in terms of the Mate desktop, I'll be supporting that through the PPA that's embedded into this uh, build. And, and it, about how long? It, uh, and uh, uh, for the duration of the LTS, and for so anyone that's already years, running, right? yeah, yeah, and for anyone gotcha. that's running fourteen ten already, they will have seen some of these features automatically turning up in the updates of their Ubuntu fourteen ten releases. Oh man, that is smooth. I got to give you a major tip of the hat. What what's the long term goal here? I mean, this is obviously going to start developing a pretty passionate following. I'd think. I mean, I'm. I'm already thinking this is the distro of choice for the studio production machines. Uh, oh, that'd and, be good. <laughs> and I, I just, you know, to me, it just seems like a slam dunk. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give this a download and and try it out. Uh, what's, but what's the long term? Because it's, you know, I mean, this could become a pretty big job. 
it could become a big job. So uh, the short term is for 1504 now, we want to get it as an official flavor. So all of that drama of me releasing just then, I don't have to do that somewhere there are monkeys in Canonical's <laughs> infrastructure doing it automatically. That's handy. Um, so that's the plan, yeah. Um, I've got the, um, I've met with some of the Debian developers a couple of weeks ago, uh, and they've agreed to work to the same time frame that Ubuntu's working to for 1504. So we're not going to introduce Mate 1.10 in 1504. We're going to do the Mate 1.10 development work in Debian Experimental and then bring that through mm. in the subsequent release later in the year. Interesting. But initially, let's get official. Following on from that, we've got some serious interest from um, some large organizations who want to use uh, Ubuntu Mate with the X2Go uh, remote sure. terminal services platform. Right. So the, the, um, the desire to get this into Ubuntu and have it as an official flavor is is a a request from some third parties who want to see this happen. Well, I think uh, you've got uh, the basis here for uh, a distribution that's going to get a lot of uh, loyal followers, and uh, the timing's pretty good. I think too. There's it's it's obviously serving a niche. The it's so funny too. Uh, for some reason, basing this on fourteen oh four feels really right, like a really smart long term play. Uh, and so uh, it just from end to end uh, just seems like it's firing all cylinders. So congratulations, you guys, and to everybody who's worked super hard on it. Thanks very much. And it's been yeah, well tested congrats. by my mum and my wife as well. So you, <laughs> you can be rest assured it works. Okay, good. That's so awesome. That, now, nice. see, now there's some QA for you, I got to say. Uh, all right. Well, uh, very good. Uh, I just want a couple of notes. We're still looking for uh, your runs Linux. You guys send them in uh, throughout the week, and I appreciate that. If you have a runs Linux, it's even more awesome. It's either your own thing. It could be. Uh, or something you find. It's total perks. If it's got video or a picture, I'd love that. That usually puts it towards the top of the list because those are always fun to look at. Send those over to Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com or like all content that you think might be great for either Linux Unplugged or Linux Action Show, submit them to our subreddit at linuxactionshow.reddit.com. And uh, don't forget you can join us live, jblive.tv. We do this here on uh, 2 p.m. on a Tuesday. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that converted to your local time zone. Uh, and uh, I'll have links to the uh, Mate uh, stuff in the show notes, so uh, go grab that. Also links to the uh, GNOME versus Groupon stuff in the show notes. And the uh, a full breakout of the differences between Chrome and Chromium. So if you were a little confused by our conversation about that, because yeah, I, I'm, I know some of you are kind of coming into this and saying, wait, wait there's a difference? Yes, there is a difference. Uh, and instead of just sitting here and rattling through all of them, I broke it all out in the show notes for you. So you can check that out. And I would be interested to know if anybody has decided to take a Chromium challenge. I heard from like two people, uh, besides uh, also Wimpy now. So Wimpy, you're the third person that took a Chromium challenge, and uh, you are the third person that's sticking with Chromium. So I wonder if anybody else tried it, and if it didn't go well for you, and what problems you ran into, send us an email, and maybe we'll do a follow-up on that next week. Could be kind of interesting, maybe. You know what? I admit, uh, maybe I just uh, am a wild man with the browser. Uh, all right, Matt, well, that's going to wrap <laughs> us up. Now uh, I'm gonna I'll I'll tell you off air my uh, super secret plans for the nice. Linux action okay. show. Under. Oh, Matt, it's big, it's real big. So uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. So tune in on live uh, jblive.tv Sunday. Also, right after the Linux action show on Sunday on the live stream, Faux Show 200. We might have something going on. So you can show up live for that if you'd like. Faux Show 200 right after the Linux action show on Sunday. Don't forget we want your feedback. It's a huge part of our show. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com/slash/contact or click the contact link and choose Unplugged from the drop-down. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday. Everybody, jbtitles.com. Let's pick our title and get out of here. Uh, 
So, uh, Popey, are you doing anything for the Ubuntu Summit that starts in a couple of days? You gonna uh, oh like get a God, haircut? Or? I am solidly busy shave? for the next three days. So we won't oh, be hearing well, you yeah, for I, a little I while. I need to have a shave. Yeah, yeah. I do need to have Popey's a shave. gonna be AFK. Oh, might have a shower as well. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> interestingly, bonus, the the lunch break in inverted commas is at five o'clock my time, which is the time when you do uh, tech talk today. Oh no, kidding! So are you're not, but you, no. I mean, really, don't tease, don't tease. No, I'm not. <laughs> That's pretty good. So, and what's crazy yeah. is you don't have to. go I'll be anywhere. busy making burritos. Yeah, you're gonna have to. Stay. You could, you know what? If you want to stop by and you had a little burrito in your mouth, I I would take it. <laughs> Popey with burrito I'm in the sure. mouth is better than no Popey. But uh, wow, okay. Wimpy, <laughs> we sorry, need to get together and have a beer at some point to celebrate this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we congratulations, do, the, you guys. All those beers we drank at Odd Count, which just clearly weren't enough worth it. Well, that was the investment. <laughs> yeah. Is that, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> wow, though, that's pretty neat. Uh, yeah, I've just about dried out. So, yeah, I think we should. Yeah. You know-